hello and good morning. Um, thank you all for coming along uh, to this session on one of our series of place-based insight events. Um, uh, obviously this one's about West Yorkshire, but we've been doing a little tour of different bits of the country from the Fenlands, Cumbria, uh, Bath and Bristol, uh, Tyne and Weir, all, all sorts. Um, but of all of these events, this is the one that sort of so far has felt most like a homecoming for me, um, having worked uh, in Leeds um, at Audiences Yorkshire and then ANCO for so long before I started at the Audience Agency. So it's it's a huge pleasure um, to see both so many of you here, but also to see various sort of old friends and colleagues um, um, in the room. So um, hopefully we'll be able to have a nice nice chat and discussion about what's going on uh, on the way through. Um, I'm sure those of you who do know me will know that I'm really happy for this to be quite conversational. Do pipe up with any questions or comments or references to your own experiences. Um, there is a section later which will specifically be about having a chance for a discussion. Um, but you know, by no means hold everything back till then if you've got things you want to want to chip in with. Uh, my colleague Isaac um, is uh, with me and he's going to keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, so before we dive in, um, just a few uh, intro bits. Um, so as I said, I'm Oliver from the Audience Agency. I'm our Director of Evidence and Insight. Uh, I'm a um, middle-aged, white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed male um, sitting in a fairly generic, bland home office kind of vibe. Um, for those who want live transcription, there's a button on the bottom. Um, if anyone has any comments or questions or needs help on the way through, do please speak up. We have colleagues around to help as well. So, here we go. Um, so, today we will be talking about um, a mixture of things, um, looking at uh, the local population, looking at local audiences, having a bit of a conversation about that, um, and then finally trying to draw that together in various different ways. Um, now, for most of these events, we've had some kind of version of a map on the other side, but I think, you know, I thought it was quite nice to, to bring to the surface just quite how many hugely exciting things are going on, um, both currently, recently, and heading forwards um, in terms of West Yorkshire. Um, and I'm sure lots of you were as delighted as I was um, when we heard about Bradford um, the other week. Um, so, um, so hopefully some of this will be useful um, for that. I know some of my colleagues are working closely with Leeds 2023. Um, and I should also, um, I guess, say a little shout out and thank you to Hannah and Pam from Leeds Council uh, for suggesting that we did this particular session in West Yorkshire and giving me the excuse to say yes to it, which I wanted to. So, uh, <laughs> so um, so that's what we're going to be talking about broadly. Um, I'll say a little bit more in terms of some introductory um, stuff and then dive in. We will have a break part way through just because two hours is quite a lot otherwise. Um, but broadly speaking, this is what we will be looking at. So I'm just going to move the uh, cameras so I can actually see what's written down. Um, so we'll be using lots of different sources to look at the West Yorkshire um, area. Uh, we'll partly, but not to, not to a huge extent, and I'll, I'll explain why later, um, but we'll partly be using a big uh, nationally representative survey that the audience agency have been running um, since uh, six months into COVID, um, so since October 2020, um, called the Cultural Participation Monitor, um, which is obviously written wrong there, it turns out, um, but that's looking at uh, attitudes and behaviours of the whole population across the country um, in terms of um, you know, before COVID, during COVID, um, and then looking to the future, uh, whether that's participatory, whether it's attendance, whether it's digital. Um, and we've been running that in multiple waves um, through COVID. Um, as I say, we've done six waves now, we've got a couple more coming. And it's really given us a, a viewpoint of sort of how people are responding, but we've collected big enough samples. We can also then look at it by region, uh, by a particular demographic slice as well and it's representative by region and ethnicity and age and uh, gender and audience spectrum. Speaking of audience spectrum, um, a bunch of what I say is going to be based on audience spectrum uh, which is the segmentation model that the audience agency um, has developed and uses um, and that it's basically it's a model that is based on cultural engagement and it's based on uh, geography as well. So it's going to be, it links people in particular places to groups who typically are more or less likely to do certain types and combinations 
of activities. And I'll describe it in a bit more detail in a sec. Um, the other thing that's quite nice about this session is that we've very recently launched a, an enhanced version of Audience Spectrum. So this is one of the first bases that we'll be sharing that and it allows it to be a bit more precise on certain things. Um, alongside that, <laughs> because there aren't enough data sources in the mix already, um, is um, Audience Finder, um, which is a audience data collection service that we, um, that we run. Um, so we're on behalf of cultural organizations, we gather in both ticketing and survey data, again, across a wide range of the country, um, many hundreds of organizations, um, you know, sort of literally millions of tickets um, included in there, or tens, probably hundreds of millions of tickets in there. Um, so we've got that data to look at, and we'll be looking at some of that, particularly in the pre-COVID period to see what the kind of background shape of engagement was um, and trends and things. And then mashed in with all of that is background information about population based on the census and various other sources. So loads of different sources, trying to pull them all together to get a kind of joined up picture. Um, but of course, a really big and important part of that picture is going to be your experiences, particularly in terms of the last few months and how things are shaping up, but um, your perspective as well. So do please feed that in and let's, let's talk more in a bit. Um, so yes, this is the final bit of intro before we get to the I would say the meat, but you know, as a veggie, I should probably say gets the corn of the issue. Um, so this is audience spectrum. Um, it divides the whole population into 10 groups. For those of you who've used it before, a couple of the groups have changed name, but that's the only change that's happened at this level. Um, and um, broadly speaking, as I said, it divides the population into 10 groups based particularly on the taking part survey from Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Um, and it typically drives people into, largely speaking, groups that are relatively more likely to engage in arts and culture, as defined in taking part, um, and those who are moderately likely or less likely. And within those, they group by kind of uh, combination of taste and habits, and um, that also links to demographics. So we've got high engaged groups here, um, of which there are three. Um, so the ultra highest engaged group um, is Metroculturals. Um, sadly, they're quite heavily co co um, concentrated in London. Um, there are some up this way, um, but not huge numbers. Um, and then the other two highly engaged groups, broadly speaking, commuter land culture buffs, the clue in, the, in a way is in the name in terms of where they live, it tends to be commuter belt, tend to be a bit older, a bit more affluent, slightly more traditional tastes, but also quite varied, uh, and experience seekers who tend to be younger, very varied in their tastes, much more likely to be present in things which are um, lower cost, but also more experimental or new or innovative, or just trying lots of different things, um, and very likely to be university graduates, etc. as we will see in a moment. We've got a bunch of middle-engaged groups of different sorts, um, which um, we'll say a bit more about some of these in more detail in a sec, so I won't, I won't dwell on all of them, but um, sort of dormitory towns, slightly older um, affluent groups um, who could engage quite a lot, have the means to, but tend to go from kind of high, high profile stuff. That's the dormitory dependables. Uh, chips and treats tends to be kind of um, younger suburban families, um, particularly. Um, and then home and heritage, which tends to be a bit more rural and more interested in particularly heritage offers, um, a bit more traditional sort of classic national trust member sort of type. Um, vibe there. Um, and interestingly, in this region, compared to some of the others we've looked at, you don't get the large pockets of home and heritage between the cities that you do in other, in other places. So West Yorkshire is sufficiently kind of built up that actually you end up with lots of drips and treats and all dependables rather than home and heritage, who tend to be in slightly more rural areas. So there you are, so that's um, those. Then we've got a variety of other groups who tend to be lower engaged, again with the caveats about, you know, in the so-called taking part art forms, so the things that the, the government is measuring. Um, so we've got a couple of the renamed segments here as well. Um, up our street, who we'll talk about more, so I won't say too much, but um, quite high concentrations, particularly in Northern and Midlands uh, terraces um, in, in big cities. Um, so obviously quite a, quite a few in this patch. Um, We've got kaleidoscope creativity, uh, which tends to be younger, um, 
potentially involved in quite a lot of things, quite digitally engaged. Um, so we've certainly seen them really quite highly engaged during the pandemic, doing partly being keen to come out and do things um, when other groups may have been a bit more cautious, but also doing more things online. But generally speaking, slightly lower engagement overall, particularly for ticketed type stuff. Um, also tends to be a relatively diverse group, um, although that's one of the groups where our new split to audience spectrum is really helpful. And again, we'll talk about that in a sec. Then frontline families, which tends to be low income um, families, um, often quite motivated by doing things with children, um, but not necessarily kind of usually, um, and they've got all these generalizations, but not usually defining their interests in terms of arts and culture. So they may well do arts and cultural things, but it's they, they don't necessarily describe themselves as arty, um, but they are quite digitally, digitally engaged as well. And then finally, supported communities, which is um, an interesting one, because this is one of the ones where adding the extra tier of detail to audience spectrum has made a most difference because this group, generally speaking, is older um, and often in um, either sheltered housing or supported housing, uh, et cetera, tend not to travel very far for often health reasons. Um, but there is a pocket of this group who are actually much younger, um, but nonetheless have some of the same kind of cultural engagement behavior patterns. Um, so that, that split allows us to go and distinguish between that. So uh, hopefully that was all right, a little sort of run through of those. It, it's quite a lot of information. We're sharing all of this obviously later um, afterwards, all the slides, so you don't have to scribble stuff down. Um, but um, there is also more information about all of these on our, on our website and we'll just link to the resources as well. So um, just to say, it's built largely off the taking part survey, which is a really long survey that people answer face to face for about three quarters of an hour um, that tell that ask loads of questions about what they do and why and what the barriers are and their demographics and rest of things. We've linked it to information about how far people live from things um, on the basis that if you don't live near any um, arts and cultural events, not going means something different than if you do and you still don't go. Um, linked it to loads of other data sources. Um, you'll see a pattern here. Um, and finally, we've kind of revised it and reviewed it in relation to you know, what we've seen in Audience Finder and other, and other sources. Is everyone with me so far? Is this, this sort of making, making sense? Um, so I mentioned that um, there's information about all of these on our website. Um, we're in the process of revise, revising all of that. Um, so you get some sort of summary information like this. Um, there's also, oh, if it will let me, um, profiles by groupings by some topics, and then each of those that expands out to much more, more information. And this is the new exciting bit is we then added each of these splits into two. And then I say exciting, it's exciting to me. Um, and it means that we can be a little bit more specific about, yes, we're talking experience seekers, but these ones maybe in this case, for example, they're more likely to still be students or very recent graduates, or they're kind of similar, but they're a little bit further along in, in life, et cetera, which obviously can make a really big difference in terms of what you're doing. So any questions um, before we, past the kind of trailers and into the, into the main feature. Lovely, okay. Um, so, um, partly because I know uh, a bunch of you and, and partly because it just makes sense, I know that there's a whole bunch of what I'm going to say which will be obvious. And to some extent, some of it just needs saying, <laughs> just so we're sort of clear. And there may be certain bits that people, some people know more than others. Um, so forgive me if I sort of state the obvious at various points. Um, hopefully it gives us a, sort of a common platform to chat a bit more detail. Um, so we're going to start off by looking at the overall demographics of the region uh, and then zoom into some of these particular groups um, and look a bit about who and where they are. Um, so here's the most obvious statement we'll have today. Leeds is big relative to other places in West Yorkshire, um, but also you know, notice Bradford population of over half a million. Um, you know, that's, that's really, really sizable almost like it deserves its own new high-speed rail station. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, but it is worth noting the population of Colgadale is much lower. Um, so when we're talking about the relative mix of some of these things, you know, a small proportion of the population of Leeds could actually be more people than a relatively larger proportion of the population of Colgadale. Um, 
In terms of age profile, um, of course, those two larger cities, as large cities tend to, skew younger. So the edge age profile, broadly speaking, is tipped younger in those two places, but it's tipped younger in different ways. Um, and again, this probably won't be a great surprise, um, but Bradford, relatively speaking, has a higher under 16 or sort of child population, uh, whereas Leeds, it tends to be a bit more concentrated at the kind of late teens, early 20s. That's not just about the fact that there are loads of universities, although of course that does make a difference, um, but it's also something about the kind of employment mix in the city and um, you know, the, the scale of what's going on and the, the draw for younger people. Um, it is worth noting that last thing, just because I think we often, we often see big universities and think, oh, that means that's lots of people. They have tens of thousands of students, but obviously the overall population um, is, is so big that there, it, there needs to be other, other younger people in the mix for that to, that to work. Um, just to, one little explainer of this graph here, because it's got a slightly weird scale. Um, what I haven't done is just done the percentage within each age category, because some of these categories are bigger than others. So where a category has twice as many years of age in it as another, it would just look big unless you divide it down. So that this is showing the percentage of people in any one year of age worth. So it basically just levels it out. So in a way, it means you don't have to worry about the scale on this. It shows that you can like the true proportion with a caveat that I've had to make up a number for the 65 plus. So I've kind of set it at 20, but, um, but yes. So that's the, over, the overall picture. Skews younger in that direction. Um, Calderdale, uh, to some extent Wakefield as well, um, skewing a little bit older. Um, although I think older probably with slightly different population groups as we will see. Um, now this is a sort of an interesting one um, because I had a bit of a rootle around and I can't find particularly good, more reliable, consistent data um, that is more recent than the 2011 census. Um, hopefully many of you do know that and do have that. Um, so this will be, you know, massive pinch of salt. Um, not least because um, we know this changed quite a lot between the 20, 2001 and 2011 census. So we would expect it to keep changing um, as we go forward. So for example, for Bradford, that white figure was I think 78 in 2001, now 67 here. I would expect it to be somewhere in the kind of high 50s, mid 50s. Um, the new census data is out soon. That would obviously be much more helpful when it arrives. Um, so, you know, I think we, we can say that it's, it is a more diverse region than, than average, um, obviously with particular, um, particular areas, um, and particularly obviously a large South Asian population. Uh, and this is another thing which will be very obvious to many of you, but probably worth saying, when we look at the um, Asian, Asian British population um, within West Yorkshire, obviously it's really high population in Bradford, but it's particularly concentrated on the Pakistani community, but also it's the place the largest Bangladeshi community. Other areas may have larger proportions um, of Indian people in them. So Kirklees to some extent, but Leeds in particular. So worth noting that, um, you know, not, not to generalize about um, Asian audiences in, in, in the area. There, actually is, there is a bit of disparity, which will have obviously all sorts of different implications in terms of you know, language and um, religion and uh, community. Um, okay, so this is a summary um, of the audience spectrum profile of West Yorkshire in the solid bars compared to Yorkshire in the middle and then England on the right hand side. And what you can see is that West Yorkshire is very similar to Yorkshire across the board, um, which isn't a surprise because it's obviously about 40% of the entire population of Yorkshire anyway. Um, and West Yorkshire is very varied. Um, but there is a slight tendency to skew towards some groups rather than others. So there are slightly more of these frontline families, for example, but only marginally. Um, there are more kaleidoscope activity. Um, and we'll see in a bit that that's particularly concentrated in Bradford. Um, and but broad, yeah, broadly speaking, apart from that, it's pretty similar to Yorkshire as a whole. Um, where it differs from England is at the extremes. So the metroculturals I mentioned that are really heavily concentrated in London. As a result, they're not concentrated elsewhere. Um, and then some of those groups at the um, up our street and Facebook families, more you know, substantially more here than, here than um, across the country as a whole. Um, and we will 
zoom in a little bit to look at um, trips and treats up our street and Facebook families later on, just to kind of because they're, they're three of the largest groups, and you know, I think it sort of makes sense to talk about talk about those more distinctive groups. Um, albeit they're not necessarily the ones that are always um, most um, highly engaged, but almost half the population are in those three groups. So, um, so this is where we get our little extra split, um, and we can see this is the top four gr um, groups we've got listed here. Um, we can see how they split between the subgroups and the descriptions of those subgroups. Um, and it's really to note that for trips and treats and dormitory dependables, the two kind of middle engaged groups, the kind of um, often suburban families of various different types, um, there's a bit of a mixture of, of everything in, 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 in the mix here. Um, with frontline families and up our street, it's much more concentrated on particular um, types of them. So for frontline families, it skews towards the younger, um, lower income families than the frontline families overall. Um, for up our street, it skews relatively older and a tendency to be um, kind of older and more urban um, and you know, based in terraces and terraces flats. Um, so when we talk about these overall groups and there's overall profile information, it's worth noting that actually for this area, it's, it's a bit more specific than that. Okay. Um, so here's then the big picture um, across the whole of the, um, of the, whole of the um, West Yorkshire area. Um, and just to note that the other one that really stands out is that kaleidoscope creativity is very particularly one of the two subtypes. So again, it's worth, if you're looking at that group, really focusing on um, the group A1, the second one of kaleidoscope creativity. Um, a lot of the other ones in that group are again actually skewed towards London. So it just sharpens the profile a bit to say actually, let's not think about the Londoners, let's talk about this other group here. Um, and then just one other little bit for now. Um, looking at the difference between local authorities to these groups, uh, we can see a few particular differences. Um, in a second, I've got a list of the wards that are highest for each of these groups. Um, and actually, I think that's, for those who know the area really well, that, that can be quite revealing in terms of um, who tends to be in them. Um, albeit, you know, you don't want to draw too broad conclusions from that. Um, but experience seekers, for example, really heavy concentration in Leeds. And then when you look at the stats, you know, bits of Headingley are like 91% experience seekers. You go, okay, so it's, it's, it's them. Um, Clydesco creativity, really big in certain areas of Bradford. Um, but then a bit more variability in terms of some of the other groups. So where we talk about up our street, probably less of a priority in Leeds in terms of um, overall um, size of the group. Um, loads of frontline families, particularly in Wakefield. Um, so, um, so yes, it's a bit of a, a bit of mixed picture. Also supported communities. And that ties into that thing I said earlier about uh, Calderdale and Wakefield having relatively older populations. Um, but in the case of Wakefield, there's a higher concentration in these groups as opposed to Calderdale. It's maybe some of the other um, the other groups who are um, like community land culture stuff is relatively high and they're a little bit older, not huge. But a little bit. So yes, here is the list of places um, and the proportions of them. Um, so some of these will be, you know, will kind of tell their own tale in terms of who they are. You know, community land culture buffs, community land culture buffs um, being really big, you know, Harewood, Wharfdale, Ilkley. Um, experience seekers, Headingley, and again, that's sort of, sort of its own tale. Um, maybe worth noting though, if, if these are the largest, highest concentrations in any given ward, how much that varies for different segments. So it's super concentrated for experience seekers, you know, that real kind of university village feel um, up in, up in Leeds. Um, but metroculturals, even at their highest, are barely, you know, they're 5% of people in a given area. So they're sort of worth setting to one side to some extent. Um, but yes, so hopefully that gives a bit of a, a bit of a feel, uh, a sense of where, what the different groups are like. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it might might be helpful if you're thinking about particular groups and what you're what you're doing. Um, and then this is just showing the those three groups of most interest. So three of the top four groups um, and where they're concentrated and whether they for for the subgroups. Um, and really, for me, the thing that sticks out from this because across the board, as we've said, frontline families and up our streets tend to skew towards one of the subtypes. 
um, but with trips and treats in some places. So these uh, dark arrows, you see there is a bit of a skew towards one type rather than the other. In the other, yeah, in Colgan Kirkley's, it really is much more even. So it's again, just allows you to slightly nuance the way you're thinking about these. Okay, so this little final bit about the sort of who's who's where. Um, so this is looking at for every ward, which is the largest segment uh, across the whole area. Um, and I mentioned earlier that in lots of places you see these kind of big swathes of Haven heritage, um, but really in West Yorkshire you don't. It's 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 these big patches of. Um, trips and treats. So it's the kind of like slightly sprawling um, suburban uh, landscapes. You know, lots of people um, between the big cities, uh, but also you know, pushing out towards the west. Um, North Leeds, we will perhaps not be surprised to know, um, has big concentrations of some of these pretty high engaged groups. Um, but one of the things I found quite useful looking at this is that historically we've often talked about the sort of the so-called Ilkley corridor. Um, so you often, when you map an individual organization's data, particularly from Leeds, but even from other, other places, um, you see this really prominent stripe going northwest out of Leeds in terms of audience patterns. Um, but what this flags is that that isn't a, that isn't a homogenous stripe. Um, it very much goes through phases. So you've got the kind of university bit, you've got the kind of dormitory dependables, you know, and then you, then you get further out into the community land culture graphs. Um, and to some extent, because some of those groups that are further out are particularly highly engaged, particularly keen to attend, the fact that they're further away gets outweighed, so which is why you get quite an even band of stre um, stretching out. Um, but it also just suggests there's, there's slightly different flavours within that overall pattern that we normally see. Um, that said, the picture you know, north and northeast of Leeds is much fatter. Um, it's just lots and lots of these um, really highly engaged, slightly more traditional groups. Um, it also gives us a bit of a hint, um, and we'll see it again later, of that kind of binot effect around Leeds. So you get this kind of band of trips and treats around the south of Leeds, compared to the north, um, but also different bands as you go further out. Um, and also, I think, notable that the Wakefield had a lot of these um, lower engaged groups um, around, the, around the city centre. Um, so, yeah, there you go. so that's, that's, the, that's the overview in terms of the population. Um, but then we can also see if we look at which groups are booking most from each ward. So this isn't just who lives there, but from each ward across the whole data set. Um, and this is literally the whole data set. It's not just booking within West Yorkshire. It's booking to anything that's in Audience Finder. Um, we start to see that actually dormitory dependables rise up in terms of relative importance. Um, and, you know, yeah, particularly, I guess, in Wakefield, they could sort of take over a bit in terms of the population. Um, and I guess what this what this says is that if you're looking at your audience data as a kind of, so who's where, this is actually the picture you're looking at relative to the actual overall population. So, you know, just to be to be aware of that that skew. Um, having said that, as we'll see in a bit, um, that actually there are lots of indications that within West Yorkshire that you know. Organisations here seem to do really well in terms of attracting um, wider range of groups. Okay, and then just finally, and this might be more useful for reference later than to dwell on too much now, um, but when we talk about some of these groups, this is where they are. So the front frontline families, big concentrations, um, particularly sort of in and around some of the city centre, well, cities and slightly out to the um, sort of near but not rural areas. Um, and treats that massive band um, sort of in the space between, um, well, I guess it's probably sort of Batley ish, isn't it? Um, Morley Batley um, and beyond. Um, and then up our street, I guess it's sort of it's skewing a little bit further south overall, but big concentrations, Halifax, Castleford, and so forth. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, I'll just have a quick check, see if there's anything in the chat, which I don't think there is. Um, but hopefully that gave a useful overview, which didn't repeat too much stuff, which you already knew. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of a, a, bit of a picture. Um, so moving on from that, 
let's have a bit of a look at who we've actually sort of see evidence of attending um, and then also a little bit of stuff about their, their attitudes and everything. So this is where I need to be super careful about describing who we're looking at because for almost all of the analysis we're looking at, we're not interested in that list of venues on the right hand side. So for now, just actually, I should probably not have shown them um, because we're talking about people who live in West Yorkshire and they could be attending in London, they could be attending in Manchester, they could be attending anywhere. Um, but we obviously pick them up during the, in the aggregate data set. Now we will see that generally speaking, they're attending in West Yorkshire. Um, so it is actually a particularly distinctively concentrated um, audience. Um, but that's who we're normally talking about. A few times we will be talking about audiences and them booking in particular places. And that's from this list of venues. So this is sort of ticketed venues um, or venues that have got at least some ticketing um, in Audience Finder. Um, there's, a, there's a spread of them across the five different local authorities. Um, they, it obviously doesn't include everything in every local authority, but it's a pretty, pretty big list. Um, and then there's quite a few other Yorkshire venues, albeit outside of, uh, outside of West Yorkshire. Um, so we've got really good coverage uh, across West Yorkshire, but of course it's not universal. It doesn't include the readers, for example. Um, and that will make a difference. Um, so that's the caveat. Um, what we've seen is, um, and this is just to give you a bit of a sense of scale, you know, per year we're talking sort of you know, 20 plus million pounds worth of um, ticketing transactions, um, almost a million tickets a year. Um, so, and we have seen growth in all of these measures in the pre pandemic period. So, running up to the pandemic, all of these things were growing a bit. Um, and we'll just look a little bit more at that as a picture. Um, so this is saying all of those different measures we've talked about, let's assume the 2016-17 figure was 100, we'll sort of set it to 100, then relative to that, how has it changed over time? Um, and so we can see, for example, the performances have grown most in that period. Um, the, and then everything else has pretty much grown in a sort of similar, similar picture. And for me, what sticks out from this is that you would expect, I think, to see income growing faster than everything else, because this is done in kind of, if you like, kind of real, um, uh, instead of straight cash value terms, it's not accounting for inflation. So you'd expect inflation to mean that income is going up a little bit above average, and it isn't which means that in real terms, the average price per ticket got cheaper over this time period, uh, which is something you interesting to note. Um, the other thing that stands out to me is that the, proportion, the number of performances went up faster than everything else. So it feels like, and we've seen this elsewhere, that in, in, across those four years, the organizations possibly were running a little bit faster to keep still. So they were getting more tickets sold and getting more people involved, but maybe putting on an even wider range of activities or even more events and so forth. Um, so that's maybe just a, a trend to be aware of um, and to have a sort of note of caution in the back of your mind. Um, but anyway, so that, that's the overall sales trend, but really it's not been a huge amount of movement in some of these measures. Um, yeah, average ticket price staying effectively, um, yeah, income per ticket effectively flat, um, which means that it's gradually going down in real terms. Um, People are booking a little bit more often, but by implication, that also means they're booking slightly fewer tickets per, per time, but it's not big differences. Um, so we've seen big swings in other places, but not really here. Um, it's really those two headlines that I think stand out. Um, then if we look at tenders by profile, we've got two different sources to use here. So we've got the list of booking organizations, uh, which is obviously the full set of hundreds that, you know, from this, that people have books to from West Yorkshire, uh, but we've also got surveys. Um, and again, that could be people um, completing surveys anywhere in the country. Um, and broadly speaking, we can see that groups that are typically higher engaged are relatively more likely to have engaged and therefore show up in this data. Um, groups that are relatively less likely to be engaged, highly engaged are relatively underrepresented. So far, so obvious. Um, but a couple of things I think that are worth noting. One is that up our street, 
Um, although we said, um, you know, it's a biggish group, but underrepresented in some places, it's actually pretty much in low end population. So it looks like organisations have been quite effective in reaching that group. You would expect that to be lower, it isn't. Um, we can also see that ticketed organisations are more likely to get these kind of middle income or, you know, middle to, in some places, higher income uh, groups. That, can, that are kind of not super culturally engaged, but able to afford to go to things and you know, pay for a nice house if it looks appealing. Um, so there's a relatively higher concentration of them. Um, experience seekers, they tend to be you know, younger, current, recent um, students or early professionals. They're more likely to be turning up at things which are um, you know, galleries and museums and um, things that are maybe freer events, um, hence higher proportion in that group, but they're not really showing up in large concentrations on the booking side maybe that implies there might be an affordability thing there because they are really culturally interested so that's maybe a thing to keep an eye out on and obviously various organizations um will have teams targeting that so i know things like Opera north and the 30 um ticket scheme will you know be kind of really zoomed in on that group um quite heavily i would have thought um but yes it's something to, to be aware of um so any questions so far? Is everyone everyone happy? Is this okay? Um, now there is a little bit of difference between different um, local authority areas in terms of this profile. Um, so all of these are set to the same scale, so you can see the kind of relative um, position of them. Um, but we can see, for example, that Bradford is getting a slightly higher proportion of bookers than surveys amongst Peter Land culture buffs with really highly engaged groups. That's probably driven by the large scale events at um, you know, St George's Hall, the Alhambra, etc. Um, whereas in some other places, the survey proportion is higher. So it, it, it might be that those groups are kind of picking and choosing a bit and they're, you know, they're going to um, you know, various different you know, bits of um, Halifax or whatever um, in greater numbers and being picked up on the survey side rather than attending the events there because they would travel um, to, the, to the events, the, the large centres and the large, large organisations. Um, uh, what else are we seeing? So Bradford ticketed organisations in particular are getting lower concentrations of kaleidoscope creativity. And given we saw that there was loads of that group in Bradford and they're quite concentrated in um, particular wards, you know, like places like Manningham, etc. Uh, that might suggest that the galleries and museums in Bradford are maybe managing to get a wider um, pool of the population um, than maybe some of the ticketed venues. Um, and again, I mean, there's, there could be all sorts of you know, reasons for that, things to discuss about that. I mean, we know, for example, that you know, the Alhambra has an enormous, well, an enormous capacity, but an enormous reach. So in fact, its effective catchment area is much bigger than Bradford. So in some ways, comparing that to Bradford is you know, slightly um, inaccurate but it's also maybe worth worth thinking about here whether all of those you know venues are managing to match the local population um if we look elsewhere just click on um so yes we saw experience seekers being super overrepresented um in surveys rather than bookers but that's even more pronounced than if you look just at leads itself um Yes, um, that's a really interesting comment from Mark. I'll come back to that in just one second, Mark. Um, that is a good point. Um, the, um, then if we look at the uh, picture in, in Wakefield, um, we're not seeing quite the same skew. Um, so that, that's kind of curious. Um, I would have expected Wakefield, if anything, to be further in that direction um, because of you know, places like the Hepworth. Um, but actually, that, that doesn't appear to be, uh, appear to be the case. Um, so, um, going back to uh, Mark's question, um, where he said, is, is the risk that these surveys is more about who fills out surveys? Um, that is, of course, a danger. Um, and I guess this is my, this is my moment to do, do a plea to all of you to be as robust and careful as you can in terms of inclusivity of who you survey and um, methods of sampling and making sure it's genuinely randomised and so forth. Um, but what we tend to see in terms of the skew on who fills out surveys is it tends to skew older, it tends to downplay families, 
Um, so seeing more experienced seekers maybe feels a bit like a surprise. Um, but you would expect to see, for example, less representation of, let's say, trips and treats or Facebook families, because you know, if you're if you're attending a museum and someone comes up to you with a survey and you've got three kids around your feet, it's just you know, in fact, frankly, one kid around your feet and they got their lights sometimes. Um, you don't want to stop and fill out a survey. So yes, that will will be a, a factor. Um, we also see that men are less likely to fill out surveys, although there isn't a particular gender skew on any of these. Um, so yes, one thing you can do with surveys, which can be quite useful, is um, if you can track the basic information about people who say, I don't have time to fill out the survey, but I can give you, you know, three or four bits of demographic information, so you can get a bit of a sense of, well, who, who, is, who are the ones who are underrepresented, maybe you should count them a bit more. Okay. Now, this little display of colourful spaghetti um, is um, looking at the changing profile year by year. So again, we've done the thing where we set 2016-17 to 100, um, and then we say, well, what's the, you know, how is each of these different groups changing over time? Um, and what we've seen here, which I think is, a, it's quite an interesting trend, particularly when you think about the impact of the pandemic coming off the back of this, because obviously that's all after this period, um, is that we were already seeing family groups relatively more likely to engage over time. Um, and that could well be because of, you know, active pushes to engage greater family, um, greater number of families. Um, it could be um, just, you know, a greater amount of provision in general. Um, but anyway, what we're seeing is a, a bit of a, more of an increase in those groups than amongst other groups, and particularly the groups that are increasing least or decreasing tend to be some of those older groups. And obviously, with an aging population, that raises some interesting questions and challenges. Um, but it also maybe is is a, a little problem to say, well, actually, what is it that could be done that would engage these groups more? Is there a reason why they're drifting off a little bit? Um, so that might be worth some, something worth looking at, um, but it also potentially is an endorsement of you know, efforts to you know, better engage families as well. Um, this is based off the booking data, which we should say. Fab, thanks, Fab. Um, so yes, yeah, so broadly speaking, what we're seeing is um, lower middle engaged family groups increasing. Um, older and maybe some of the higher engaged groups just got a flat or dipping. Um, okay. Yes, yes, that is a that is a very fair point. Isaac has mentioned that the um, by sheer volume, there's a greater volume of um, uh, booking data than survey data. Albeit, yeah, we are still talking thousands of surveys, so it's uh, yeah, it's quite big for survey data, but it's small compared to the um, okay. And then, if we look at where people are coming from, and this is based on the surveys, um, we can see that some places seem to have a much more local audience than others. Um, um, in fact, I think, because there's going to be a whole load of stuff about geography we're about to talk about, I think it might be good for us to take a little five minute break now to give people a chance to, you know, take a comfort break, whatever. Um, and then we'll talk about a whole load of different geographical things all in one, all in one, all in one go. So if that works for everyone, have a little, little, little break in the flow of um, data and information. Um, so I'm just going to, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about the geographical picture um, that we're seeing in different places. Um, but do please, if you do have any other comments and questions, you, you pop them in the chat. Um, and particularly as you know, as we come to a discussion a bit shortly, it'd um, be really good to have your, your thoughts and how things are going. Um, so as I said, we looked in the audience finder survey data um, to look at the relative distances people were traveling. Um, so this is based on the distance traveled by residents this place, not at venues in space. Um, so what we're seeing is that Wakefield residents are traveling less far on average. Um, and that's probably partly linked to 
um, both being sort of attached to a local cultural offer, but also if they do travel a bit further, the next further place to go, Leeds, is actually really quite close. So you're probably not getting a sort of huge, um, you're not seeing that next place stretching the drive time in the same way that you would see maybe um, like people in Huddersfield where they're going to slightly further um, to other, other places. Um, also called the people staying relatively local. Um, so again, these are the two places with a slightly older um, uh, profile, uh, which might be might be a factor. Um, so th the other thing I thought was interesting is that Kirklees was the highest. Um, and I wondered if that was because um, there's quite a lot of being people being pulled into that next band because from Kirklees you're kind of stretching out to Leeds or Bradford or um, or indeed, you know, Sheffield, Manchester, or wherever. Um, so I think there might be a little bit of that that going on um, and affecting the kind of distance people, people are traveling. Um, but it's often quite useful to think about the, uh, for people, wherever they are, what are their kind of range of options at different distance radiuses? Because um, then it can really affect the choice they're effectively having to make between different offers. Um, so if they're sat right between, um, let's say that they're bangs back between uh, Leeds and Bradford, then they've got kind of offers in either direction. So we're therefore, which way do they go? Um, but once they skew in one direction or the other, um, the lure to get them to travel to a place that's further away means it has to be something which is more different or more distinctive. Um, although of course we do see a bit of that happening. Um, that travel information does also link to engagement patterns, um, it seems. So, for example, Wakefield had the highest proportion of people who had attended before and attended quite recently, um, so within the last 12 months, um, and called it Elgin was second on that list. So they're not traveling super far, but they are traveling to places that are you know, previous um, places they've attended. So we're talking about, like, if you like, there's this greater churn of a local audience as opposed to, for example, Leeds and Bradford are picking up more new people. Um, so it's, you know, it's a bit of a Bit of a difference. Um, and again, we could delve into all detail about you know the, what the profile of these different groups would be, but that's uh, yet more weeks of work. <laughs> so, um, so then looking at the wider geography in terms of where people are attending, this really emphasizes the thing I was saying earlier about how local the um, West Yorkshire audience stays relative to other areas um, that we've looked at. Um, so a third of West, West Yorkshire residents are booking to Leeds, almost a third to Bradford. Yeah, other large proportions, you know, totaling, getting on for another third across the other three local authorities and really very few elsewhere. Um, so I'm, I, I'm really particularly surprised how low the rest of Yorkshire and Humber is. Um, when you think that there's quite a lot of Yorkshire number that's quite close. Um, but um, so really worth emphasizing, it, it, we're talking about really a very local audience. And we'll look at that split by local authority in a sec to show who's staying local from where. But um, I think this really backs up where we've seen, for example, um, the cultural strategy that Leeds City Council produced a, a while back, where it was even more locally than this, it was saying, well, actually, we want to look at engagement within communities, not just in the city centre, let alone spread out across the, across the region. Um, which isn't to say that collaboration isn't important, but it's worth being aware of the needs to kind of reach out to everyone by actually having things really quite locally. Um, so that's the overall picture, super concentrated. Um, and similarly, but if not quite as extremely concentrated, when we look at the survey data, so two thirds, um, visiting within West Yorkshire out of the survey data, whereas the other figures are the booking data. Um, if we then look at the proportions relative to the proportion of population in each of these places, um, it's maybe worth noting that Leeds and Bradford are both getting higher proportions of people attending in their area than in, you know, they are proportionately in terms of the population as a whole, uh, whereas some of the other areas um, I guess most notably Kirk Lees, um, there's a greater tendency to be traveling out to the other local authorities. Um, that's also partly about travel networks and convenience and, and whatever else, but um, 
maybe worth noting. Um, so this is this, and in fact, the next slides are essentially repackaging of this information. Um, is where people who live in each local authority are buying tickets. So this is um, based on proportion of tickets rather than unique individuals, but um, but broadly speaking, you can see, of course that in most cases, most people are attending where they live. Absolutely what you'd expect, of course. Um, really high in, in Leeds, really high in Bradford, um, but still pretty high in Coldwell. Um, what is perhaps more interesting is where it isn't such a stark picture. So again, you've got that thing about Kirk Lees with you know, a greater variety of where people are going. Um, Wakefield again you can see the kind of prominence of Leeds as a kind of neighbour um, a sort of alternative cultural offer um, so although we saw that people in Wakefield were on average staying quite local clearly there are quite a few going to Leeds so Leeds not that far and they're not going any anywhere else very much roughly speaking um, so yes and also I've noted that those figures of people travelling elsewhere in the country also relatively low um, Perhaps, you know, the particularly Leeds and Bradford, I guess, with, with, with a lot of cultural infrastructure. Um, there's sort of, if you like, there's, there's less alternative things to, to uh, travel to. And of course, who borders onto the Pennines as opposed to the rest of Yorkshire, et cetera, will make a difference to some of these as well. Now, this one <laughs> looks super complicated, but it is actually a repackaging of the same information. Um, and I've got a couple of slides which just help break it down in, into pieces. Um, and this is where it's worth us being clear about, you know, that list of venues I showed you earlier. So we saw that there were loads of different venues across lots of um, uh, different local authorities within that list. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there are huge players missing that I'm aware of out of the kind of um, theatre pool, certainly within the, within the region. Um, but the exact composition of that pool will affect these numbers. So slight caveat on that. But the thing that struck out to me is that Bradford is a net importer of engagement, uh, certainly in terms of ticketed activity, um, from all of the other local authorities already um, across West Yorkshire, which slightly surprised me. I was expecting that there would be a lot in that direction, but a little bit heading the other way towards Leeds. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's that's really quite interesting. Um, I do think Leeds Playhouse was being refurbished during part of this period, which probably will affect these figures slightly. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that's only one of sort of like seven or eight different venues in Leeds. Um, so yes, so broadly speaking, Bradford's a net importer from all of the other areas. Leeds is from everywhere else. Um, particularly, again, we see that Wakefield. Uh, Wakefield link, um, really, really strong effect there. Um, and then we have this sort of interesting effect uh, at the bottom. So if we look at this, so everyone's going you know, to Bradford more than Bradford's going to them. Um, similar, similar for Leeds, everyone else. Uh, and then this final little triangle at the bottom um, where they sort of, everyone's switching with everyone else. <laughs> so it's, there's, there's no neatly clear picture of you know, one of these centres being uh, predominant. But, you know, People from Calderdale more like to go to Kirklees, people from Kirklees more like to go to Wakefield, people from Wakefield more like to go to Calderdale, albeit it's almost quite marginal. Um, I wouldn't lean on that too heavily because, you know, clearly there's fewer venues and or, you know, less good aggregate data there, but it does suggest a, kind of a greater kind of evenness um, amongst some of those um, audience patterns, audience flows. Um, and um, these arrows are roughly, very roughly scaled to give a sense of the overall feel of it. Um, yes, so that's the kind of overall picture. There is people being drawn, broadly speaking, um, northish. Um, does that surprise anyone? Um, or does that, does that feel like what you would expect? Has anyone got any thoughts? Maybe if they want to pop anything in the chat, um, or if you're based in one of those areas and see large numbers of people attending from elsewhere or um, 
we did do some analysis a while back for Leeds City Council, sort of in the in the early days of thinking about um, 2023, uh, where we looked at the kind of which art forms and activities tended to import or export audiences uh, within the local authority. Um, and that was quite interesting. You, you could certainly see that some things were very clearly, you know, catering to a much more local audience. Um, other things, I mean, I think the, the two that stood out were, I think, you know, Northern Ballet and Upper North had the tendency to be importing audiences, I suppose, to um, vice versa. Um, okay. Um, so, um, yes. This is the one that I would be really keen to get any any reflections on, partly because, as I say, I was slightly surprised by that Leeds Bradford picture, um, despite knowing you know, Pearl Hamlin and Waters um, Um So next up, we've got, um, oh, yes, Sam. Do you want to- oh, Sorry, sorry, it took me too long to unmute there. Um, ah, hi. Sorry, I, I know you've changed slide now, but just on, on the previous slide, yeah. and I, I don't want to go into the whole, oh, it depends who you ask, and, and you, you know, because that's that's the, we all know that there's, you have to accept stats at some point, but if, I do also find it surprising, but could it be, I haven't seen the full list of, of the, the bookable um, locations that you use, but could it have to do with, in Wakefield, for example, I, I can imagine we have less bookable things that you track compared to potentially Bradford or Leeds. But that, that's not really my question. My question was going to be, do you think that these arrows, let's say that one place gets more bookable things, do you think that that then translates into people being more aware of the place and then potentially also going to more free events that are not as trackable? Or do you think that people go to bookable things, but then don't necessarily go to the place, if that makes sense? Yes, I, 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 I do. Um, so to pick up different bits of that, um, there, we do have more venues um, in Leeds and Bradford than Wakefield and elsewhere. Um, that is, I think, partly a true reflection of the you know, number of venues for example we've got Theatre Royal in here but um, but yes I think that there, there is more of a risk of us missing substantial proportions of all the venues in let's say Wakefield potentially um, the um, the effect so I think one of the factors that's probably going on is that people's attendance behaviors and this is one of the things that could be really uh, interesting and telling i think post pandemic um, is that people's attendance behaviors tend to link to where they live and where they work for those who work obviously um and so probably and this is partly why i expect to leave bradford to be the other way around that where you have strong commuting patterns you probably would expect more people to be commuting into leeds from wakefield than into wakefield from leeds on average um so probably there's more opportunity for people from Wakefield to be attending in Leeds because they were there anyway. So there's probably a bit of that happening um, and a bit of a tendency that people may be, if you like, they're likely to attend up the scale of, of cities or, or, or settlements rather than um, going elsewhere to somewhere that's not as big. So, you know, I can see people being drawn to Leeds because it's the biggest thing, you know, for a long way. Um, so I expect that to be a bit of a factor. Um, increasing provision in one place and does it therefore drive non-ticketed provision um, I would imagine that does have an effect but it's probably relatively marginal compared to for example you know, going for shopping or for other leisure or you know eating out or um, nights out or whatever um, it will be part of the picture but probably it's it's more about the overall kind of is this the kind of place i like to go or I make a habit of going um so you know for example i would imagine that leeds having a john lewis now that sheffield doesn't is going to be drawing people from sheffield towards leeds to a certain extent in a way that would also be true of different venue provision but you know it's it's, it's all that other stuff that's part of people's lives that matters as well 
Um, does that answer your question, sort of? Yeah, thank you. And I, I realise my question was a, a weird one. So yes, I appreciate that. Thanks. No, weird is good. Um, that's, a, that's a mantra of mine. Um, so, so, um, There's an interesting question. Um, so just share. Yeah, just on the point on the, um, you can tell something about Brad Fidelamba is influencing. Um, or we can we can kind of see from the data is that the Bradford theatres, I guess, is the kind of umbrella. I assume that that's kind of under had a lot of uh, a lot of like pull in the ticketing data. Seem to be like very successful in terms of ticketing. Um, so I wonder if perhaps that's that's why I don't know if they're just they're particularly good at representing data that um, they're pulling maybe from Leeds to uh, to the the Bradford theatres like like the um, Alhambra perhaps. Yeah, and of course, I mean, the, the Alhambra being the largest venue or the largest theatre in the region, there's obviously yes. So that probably is a big part of that. The Media Museum um, would make a difference if we were including survey data in this, but although they have been ticketing post pandemic, I think that wasn't going through Audience Finder in the pre pandemic period. So I think that wouldn't be showing up in here. Um, but um, so, oh. Nev, yeah, um, hello. Um, I'm definitely surprised by Bradford net import from Leeds. Pretty fairly equal. Um, so yes, um, so it's a smaller proportion of population, but but therefore more people. So yes, I guess that's probably another thing to to mention is yeah, as you say, more people gives more opportunities. You know, more people who can be doing it. So that's a that's a fair point. Um, uh, and then Ralph was saying less bookable venues. Yes, that's true. Um, I think, and I can't remember, but we do have survey data from the um, Huddersfield Art Gallery and some of the museums, I think. Um, but yes, obviously that wouldn't be in this as, as ticketing data. Um, uh, so there's two interesting things um, about what um, Steph's mentioned there about the West um, Indian Carnival. One is, of course, that we're not, this isn't including international data anyway. And yes, you will get those kind of international travellers um, get those really big, really big high profile events. Um, and yes, you're right. Obviously, certain types of events are more or less likely to be ticketed. Um, so yes, we should be just really, really cautious, particularly, I guess, with such a large event that's reaching out. Know, votes really strongly in your, in your own community it's um yeah we want to make sure we're not just ignoring <laughs> that yeah and we um, should also note that um things like festivals because they only um some that aren't aren't consistently doing it every year or every i don't know giving data every month we have to remove from the data so it has to be a, like a very consistent organization um giving us good data to, to show the year by year trend otherwise we obviously we we remove it from the list of organizations sort of Yes, although just to be clear on that, we remove things if they're, they're not showing data in successive years, but obviously an annual event would still be there unless we were then looking at month by month analysis, in which case we'd then go to the next step down. Um, but yes. Um, uh, ooh. Uh, so Hannah has asked, can we dive even deeper into data to discover whether ticketing events are touring versus new productions? or what programming. Um, so we can look at art forms and we can get quite specific in terms of exactly what it was or when it was um, or which groups it was. So for example, we could identify the people who were traveling from one place to another and then look at the profile of those relative to population. All of that stuff we can do and is, I, I would say straightforward, but Isaac might not thank me for saying that. Um, given that he's often the one doing all the hard work in the background, but it, it is it is doable. Um, looking at new production versus touring productions is really hard because you have to be able to identify that it is the same production at different places and do it on a kind of industrial scale to be able to sweep up everything. Um, and that's really hard, particularly because you very often have things with the same name that are on at the same time, but actually no, no connection to each other. Um, and the, the obvious one would be something like um, there's a show at a theatre called Romeo and Juliet. You know, is it a ballet? Is it a play? Is it a kids' theatre performance? Is it 
another version of the same thing is it whatever so that gets really tricky um but we can i mean depending how specific we're being we can zoom in on particular things and then we can just actually literally look them up but obviously that's that's quite manual um thank you it's but, interesting because uh, i guess i'm thinking about risk that audiences are prepared to take in terms of if they like because i'm still fascinated by that bradford pull that what is it in Bradford that people are then wanting to go to see versus, you know, whether whether the mix of what's on offer in Leeds, perhaps there are other um, things that, because you're talking, but just like, I'm trying to sort of in my brain work out your layers of the audiences and who's prepared to go to what type of thing and, and yeah. whether risk, risk of engaging with something that you know, whether they're more likely to go to a particular location in order to sort of engage with something because there's a higher, certainty for them that they'll know what they'll get and whether whether because Leeds is a bigger area with a different more mixed cultural offer whether there's a different risk involved does that make sense it does so I mean this isn't based on recent looking closely at the data but it is based on you know, having looked at it in various forms for a while um one of the, yeah a really big chunk of the um, the audience being pulled into Bradford will be things like um, yeah, the pantos and the musicals and things at the Alhambra. Um, and obviously those those are often a very known product, you know, sort of high profile. You know, often they are the big, big touring productions. That, you know, people will know what it is and be expecting it and so forth. Um, and indeed may have been before and be attending in large groups, which is the other thing, I guess, is that this is looking at tickets and therefore individual attendances but things that will tend towards larger groups like exactly those things i've mentioned will therefore show up more prominently than if we were looking at um, um i guess um the ver the greater variety or the number of different things people are being to um you might get you know more individual bookers going to things um, elsewhere on average um all of that is stuff that we can delve into in more detail um and i guess you know part of that process is in the process of delving into it you then can maybe sort of clean bits of the data out and say actually we don't want to look at those we just want to look at very particularly this art form or or these types of people what are they doing um so we can do that another thing we can do uh, which we haven't done here um but um we are looking at doing it um more broadly um is look at the kind of what we've what we describe as the kind of watersheds between places so which wards if that's the geography we're using um are people more likely to go one way or another and i suspect in um leeds and bradford that could be particularly interesting because you end up with these kind of so for example someone like ilkley it's in bradford but probably has quite a strong link to leeds but exactly how to, so in a way you'd almost expect that to be cutting against this trend um but you know you'll you'll get sort of some interesting interesting patterns like that um so yeah and that, that's definitely something we can look at in more detail um in due course um just aware of this uh, lots of lots of comments bubbling away uh, let's see so talking about oh milky um and bronte parsonage um and loads of rural heritage um indeed that's where i was this bank holiday um so that might be up in figures because there's quite a broad draw um i think that's true in general um these because it's um just ticketed data and i don't think for example the bronte parsonage um although it's ticketed i don't think those tickets end up in audience finder um so i think it's on a different system um so i don't think that would be showing up in here but yes clearly um that kind of you know this big tourist draw in the kind of north of the district um which would be which would be happening um and yeah um and oh, sorry i can't see who that comment about kirk lees is from catherine um yes and it's it's you know i guess it, it, it's a thing that's distinct to to kirk lees about you know how connected it is uh, which is probably part of that um i mean obviously there are also there are pockets of relatively lower engagement within kirk lees itself um hence um cultural scene and some of the kind of um you know cpp work etc there um 
but yes, obviously all those those links are are really key. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure if you said it, but yeah, Catherine made a good point that just the where Kirklees is, as you touched on, it's like where you can travel to very easily. So if Kirklees borders everywhere else, then um, very easy for people to just go to other other places. Whereas if you're on a, the very edge of the region, then you're not necessarily going to go to the far region. So yeah. Um, and the other thing, which I mean, it's not a huge chunk of the data, so we need to be a bit careful about it. But one of the things I think that is quite interesting in terms of Kirkley's attendance, looking at it the other way, so actually we wouldn't pick it up often in here, is that with things like the Contemporary Music Festival, that has a absolutely, you know, really super international and national reach. Um, so, you know, in a way that's probably the other way, but because we're not looking at the populations of um, those other places, we're not seeing them with the data. Um, number one touring, yeah, you know, I think you're right, Mark. Um, um, and Hannah's comment about it's positive there's movement and engagement across the region, I think that's definitely true. Um, breadth and diversity, I think, is really interesting, um, partly because I think there, there is so much variety in the different specialisms, so you get the kind of sculpture triangle focus, and you get you know, kind of Major events and then you know, the you know, big touring, etc. Um, so yes, I think that the the combined offer is huge. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's good that it's varied, but it is worth being aware that people's tendency to attend is very local. So we want to make sure there are some opportunities locally as well as um, this kind of nice flow between around the region, and certainly not losing people elsewhere. Um, one of the things I find interesting with that, um, I'm not just saying this from where I live in Sheffield, um, but um, Sheffield theatres, yeah, really has a huge catchment and really large volumes, and it's really local, and yet it's not pulling people out of West Yorkshire to the same extent that it is out of Derbyshire and um, Nottinghamshire and wherever else, uh, which again is, I guess, a reflection of the strength of the offer up here. Um, and and the other thing, yeah, you know, I'd say just to, just to to add to Mark's point about it being an exciting few years, and my goodness, it is, um, is uh, Rotherham Children's Capital of Culture in twenty twenty five as well. I think yeah, that's really exciting. Um, and one of the things I, <laughs> I'm just a slight tangent. But one of the things I really love about all these big celebrations that are happening is that some of them are about places winning an existing national competition, like Bradford. Um, but I, I also really like the ones where particular places in Yorkshire have said, you know what, we're going to have a European equivalent to capital culture. It's not going to be called that, it's just going to be Leeds. And that's, we're going to do it because we want to do it. Um, in the same way that Rotherham was saying, there isn't a children's capital culture. Why not? There should be. We're going to do it and we're going to be it. Um, and you know, Wakefield having their own year, year of culture. So I think it's, it's really, yeah, I, I quite like that. Um, spirit of just saying, right, we're going to do it. Um, I think it will. It will make a real, I think, impression because because it's so extended in terms of time period. There'll just be lots of prominence over a rolling period of time, and lots of you know, collaboration, you know, continuing to be able to work on things. So yeah, sorry, I got a bit enthusiastic there, but it's it is very exciting. <laughs> um, so yes, so it might be it's worth us looking in more detail at some of these um, interrelations and flows, um, and seeing you know, exactly who it is that's traveling. Um, we certainly found looking at Leeds uh, a few years back, um, because obviously Leeds has that kind of spike in population of the kind of 1624s, um, lots of people in that group, um, but they don't tend to travel. Um, so they don't tend to flow out of Leeds into other areas in the same way that some of the other groups might be. Um, so again, that might be a, a thing to be aware of that even where they're really engaged in culture, be engaged in culture where they are, they won't sort of travel to the same extent that of as well and that's partly about where people are living as well i guess if you're you know living out in round hay then traveling to bradford isn't so much different from traveling into leeds compared to if you're living in a city center flat so um okay sorry massive tangent um where were we <laughs> well, thank you that's really really interesting um uh, da, da, da. So, yes, so in terms of concentrations of where where the um, bookers are based, um, and sorry, this is booker data, not survey data, which obviously um, would have a slightly different picture. Um, 
So we see the big band across the top of Leeds, which really corresponds to the community land culture buffs, sort of older, highly engaged, more affluent, etc. Um, groups there. Um, we still do see actually quite strong pockets around the south of Leeds, um, despite the fact that it's maybe not such a sort of super um, super concentration of those highly engaged groups. That's probably partly, and it's maybe linked to our previous conversation about the um, the fact that there are so many different places available from there. So, you know, although, you know, I guess if, you, if you're in Morley, you're really not that far from any of these um, major centres. So opportunity to do things is really, really high. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, try and persuade Brad to naysay us. That sounds like a, sounds like a, a challenge that would be worthwhile, but maybe, maybe a scary one. I don't know. Um, I know there's a, there's some interesting mixed views in Bradford, aren't there? Um, but anyway, um, so yes, you see these concentrations, you get this little concentration down towards the peak. Obviously, there's a bit more tendency for people down here to be traveling out into other bits of, you know, either over towards Manchester or down towards, towards Sheffield or other bits of South Yorkshire. But um, that might be an interesting thing to look at, you know, which, which direction people are going from there. Um, if we just look at bookers to local organisations, it's not a radically different picture. It just pulls it in a little bit from the north and east, which you would expect because you're for, you know you're now excluding York and Harrogate, for example, um, and Hull maybe. Um, so, but yes, yeah, same broad picture. Um, but again, I think it's kind of interesting this kind of corridor, so to speak. Um, partly that it's a little bit more patchy. Um, in the sense that there's a kind of middle bit that's not as concentrated, um, but also that it is variable. So maybe worth noting. Um, and then this one is just to account for the number of households. Um, obviously, places with more people will have more attendance by virtue of that. So this is kind of to account for it. Um, and here, I think you do see um, a you know, slightly lower penetration in bits of Bradford, um, particularly sort of, I guess, to the west of the centre. Um, and so that's maybe interesting that in, in some ways, because some of those Bradford venues have got the kind of wider reach, it could be that they're kind of slightly, um, they're drawing an audience sort of beyond the local area, but maybe not as much as the super local audience. So, you know, I guess one of the things which I'm sure Bradford 2025 will be looking at is about, you know, lots of really community-based engagement. And I think this would back up the case for that um, in terms of, you know, opportunities for people to do stuff really on the doorstep um, because often people need to engage really locally if they don't engage a lot because traveling a long way to something you're not familiar with or don't really know if you like it and it costs more and whatever else is a bit of a reach if you're going to really engage people it needs to start local um, okay so just looking on a bit about um, how so many groups feel about attending um, so this is where we looked at the cultural participation monitor data. Um, and we were going to present a sort of an overall picture of, this is how Yorkshire compares the whole country um, in terms of all these different things we looked at in terms of attitudes, attendance, whatever else. Um, but really there wasn't much to say beyond Yorkshire on average looks like the country on average. Um, and yes, of course, there are pockets of higher or lower, et cetera, but the broad picture was, was fairly consistent. Um, what we do see is a real difference in terms of particular groups. Um, so I'll jump particularly to that third bullet point here, which I think contains some of the key headlines, which is younger people are more likely to have engaged during the pandemic, to have engaged digitally during the pandemic as well, um, to have been first back, to be most regularly back, um, and to feel most comfortable about attending again. Um, so that's one really big skew and clearly, two of the areas we're talking about here have higher proportions of younger populations so that's likely to be a kind of an opportunity there um families as well um there is a tendency towards um higher um engagement um post pandemic um and i think when we were slightly more in the teeth of it it was partly because families felt like they'd soaked up the risk of catching covid from the fact that their kids are running around licking everything anyway so at that point going out to the theater isn't a massive extra risk um so i'm very casual about 
the um, children having had my own. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say this if I didn't have my own. Um, but um, so family, there's, there's a really, um, the really, really key thing there. Um, of course, if you're super engaged in arts and culture, if you're really, really motivated, um, then you're relatively more likely to want to come back. So we, we do see that in the data that really highly engaged um, people um, are faster back. And of course, um, being older, having disabilities, being more clinically vulnerable uh, is, of course, then linked to um, being having having greater portions about reattending. Um, and indeed, although attitudes are shifting amongst the whole population, it is worth noting that. Um, well, I suppose one way of looking at it is that the the attitudes about um, of disabled people about attending and whether it's safe to do so in March this year was about the same as it was for the non-disabled population in kind of last autumn. So at the point where things were actually still really quite prominent, that's how uncomfortable disabled audiences are feeling now. So it's sort of worth being aware of the need, the benefit of making um, certain, you know, certain events, performances, et cetera, you know, especially COVID safe still, um, and you know, capacities and, and so forth. So, um, so those are kind of the broad cross-cutting factors that I think we play, in, play into this. Um, linked to that, some of these groups that tend to have more families, that tend to be a bit younger, are equally more likely, therefore, to say they're happy to get back to normal. They think the measures of, you know, were, were more extreme than they needed to be. Um, and that, relatively speaking, they're happier to, to start attending again. So that would suggest, and this is where we pan back to that kind of what was the previous trend, we were seeing lots of family groups increasing the proportion even before the pandemic struck and those are the groups who maybe are relatively more likely to be happy to attend now as well so it really does kind of flag the opportunities and doing kind of more um you know family friendly um younger pitched work um one thing i would absolutely love input from, from people on if you would be happy to share is what you're seeing in terms of audience profile since people have been coming back because we've had various conversations with organizations uh, across the country where they've been a little bit surprised about what has and hasn't sold in the last six months um, in that things that traditionally might have been considered really safe kind of core program um, but that things that tend to appeal maybe to a slightly older more traditional audience um, have been harder to sell and things that were often in the program more as a kind of this is something we think is creatively really interesting and worth doing but we're not sure it's going to be hard to get an audience for it have actually sold relatively better than they expected um and i don't know if that's something that any of you have seen or have you seen the opposite um or have you seen certain types of things doing really well compared to other types of things um i would be intrigued i'm sure you'd all each be intrigued to hear um, from each other about that as well so if anyone feels brave um, to, to share any thoughts on that. Um, and if you want us to not record it so it's not part of anything that gets shared, um, that might be a good idea. But um, if anyone has any, any experiences they want to share. Um, yeah, I'll share, Oliver. Um, uh, we came back um, around, yeah, autumn 2021, that's right, about September 2021. Um, and it was a very slow burn, as you would say, with regard to yeah. not just particularly tickets, but more participatory um, yeah. stroke audiences. Um, and it took to about Christmas time. And then it, since then, it's just gone huge the demand of the people coming towards us um yeah we're, we're, we're ch being challenged with our capacity so it started us very slow and you could feel people were a little bit hesitant regarding coming out of covid and the, you know were their children safe coming into the venue and da, and, da, and, da. and i think once we started that process and people came in and saw we were still adhering to and we still are adhering to um social um, um covid safe guidelines uh, and again a word of mouth starts spreading doesn't it people start talking etc mm -hmm. etc et and so i would say um we're, we are now in a position of being very well since christmas hugely undated uh, uh with audiences stroke participants and any events that we've been putting on have been yeah chocker chocker people want to come out and yeah they, yeah they want to come out yeah, so we've got a high energy of demand and 
engagement, I would say, um, yeah, since um, COVID sort of started That's easing cool. out from so our, just, our, our perspective. So just to say, for those that don't know you, it's RJC. Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, yes. That's RJC, RJC Dance, yeah, yeah. Um, but also you tend to have a younger audience. So. We do. Children and young people from the age of, I mean, interestingly enough, from the ages of uh, six to 17, uh, we'll be working with, we haven't, interestingly, we haven't reconnected with the four to five year olds, the really younger ones. We haven't done that as yet, uh, which we're hopefully planning to do. Um, probably 2023, we'll move into that sphere. But from being very packed uh, pre-COVID to obviously COVID happening, and it's almost like, we're rebuilding we're rebuilding um and the general atmosphere uh, in the um area is a uh, local area is is engagement to get involved people really do want to get involved i think um so i think it's brilliant news regarding bradford fantastic obviously we've got 2023 coming too as well um and i just think i think the yeah, the pandemic has changed people's attitudes towards culture and enjoyment. And um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's a little comment. <laughs> no, that's, that's fab. I mean, it's, it's great to hear that it's going well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, has anyone else? Has anyone else got, got experience of how it's how it's been going? Um, I mean, at the risk of putting you on the spot, just because I'm interested, um, and forgive me, um, but I can see the slung lower here, and I, I I would hope that some of the kind of things that you program, and indeed the fact that you've been doing loads of stuff engaged in the local community could hopefully have meant that things are going really strongly but i don't know if is that is there, any, is there anything you you would like to share or or anyone else <laughs> yeah and, and we just found like most places that people book later on now so people aren't booking as far in advance so um there's um particularly with a week a couple of weeks before we're putting something on then then we get a sort of rush for that um but I, I i understand that that's the same for most places at the moment yeah 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 which does bring its own challenges doesn't it in terms of knowing what stuff needs extra help <laughs> and then and it doesn't um so that's interesting so leeds museum saying um attendance poor for niche adult events but stuff for families is much stronger than school holidays yeah that's interesting um Yes, I found myself going to Leeds Museums a couple of times um, with with family, which um, I guess fits that trend at least. Um, <laughs> um, I saw someone raise their hand. Sorry, and I've lost it or lost who it was. Um, I think it was me, Jan from uh, from Keith the Creative. Brilliant. Yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just, just two things we've noticed. Um, things where we needed people to book, even if they were free, were far less well attended, or were attended by. And I'm completely stereotyping more of the white middle class audiences um, and um, things that were, were, were free and you could spontaneously turn up uh, uh, were definitely much better attended at our festival. And then also thinking of your thing about um, niche things, you know, that are maybe a bit higher risk. Um, and it's maybe about people wanting to take different types of risks. So um, our big event in the park in the dark was absolutely thronged <laughs> um you know because it's exciting to come out in the dark for families you know and bring their kids out and things with the lantern it was one of our lantern parades and the giant puppets um so those things where it's a little bit different from what you might be able to do normally and there's a little bit of sort of scary risky but you know safe things to do maybe um we found those have gone down really really well that's interesting i think i think that appetite for for something different and i think like, like steph was saying there's certainly a, a chunk of the population who are like we've missed out on a load of attendance and we need to cram it all in now you know like you know i've you know, really understimulated right what can we go and see so um uh, there's a question i think from hannah if i can find it which was about um location choices so outdoor is an interesting thing so um i mean I'll, I'll chip in a couple of things but if anyone else has anything to add on this please do um do chip in um 
so we've seen people saying they expect to attend more locally in future than they did before the pandemic and that they're more aware of stuff to do locally than they were before which is kind of interesting it's an overall picture um people we also asked people how much risk did they feel there was sort of health wise in terms of engaging outdoors indoors or just carrying out your daily activities um and attending cultural events outdoors was seen as safer than your general activities but obviously indoors was less safe um so actually i think the outdoor thing there is lots of opportunity there um and yeah i mean obviously the various stuff coming up at millennium square would kind of would tie into that quite nicely as well as various other bits um i guess people have people have probably seen some possibilities of outdoor programming that they may not have opted for but tried out because that was what was available so that um so yeah so there, there, there might be a bit of that um has anyone else sort of thought about a longer term shift towards more outdoor activity um because i think that is quite an interesting potential trend should be if we could somehow change well in a good way change the weather for the better um the other thing was um that question about attitudes to pricing um so you know, probably feel etc um and obviously we've already had some some comment on that um i think it really depends by group though because i think there are some there are some bits of the population who've become better off in the course of covid because they've basically had cuts to spending and not to income um and it's not a huge chunk of population, but it is a significant one and it skews towards traditional arts tenders. So there's a question mark about whether people are, whether those groups are the ones who are happy to come back out again, but where they are, I think there are some people who have, have money to spend. In the context of large tracts of the population, that's absolutely the opposite picture. Um, and COVID itself was harder on certain groups, um, you know, people on lower incomes in, um, um uh, sort of more manual and routine some routine occupations um and also they don't be hit hardest by cost of living stuff coming off the back of it um so i think there's a real challenge there in terms of affordability and that's where you know large scale free to access local activity i think is really you know really key um but i don't know specifically about pay what you feel beyond that when we looked at attitudes that online during the pandemic um younger groups were generally skewed towards being keener on that type of way of paying than older groups um so older groups might be happy to pay for a regular payment for something or a subscription or whatever um whereas younger groups are more happy with a kind of like you know either literally pay what you feel or donation based or whatever um so, yeah, so Hannah from Leeds saying they funded more outdoor activity. Um, so it's great, great to hear. Um, so yes, here we are. Uh, oh, where are we? Non-traditional larger indoor spaces too. Ah, like the shopping centre. Great. Hard. Yes, not tracked by formal data, or at least not tracked by art sector formal data. Who knows what the shopping centre is collecting? Um, but yes, that's that's really interesting. Um, so yes, and I, I mean, hopefully, it's also. I think we have seen some evidence of this that it has strengthened people's belief in the importance of arts and creativity across quite a broad part of the population. Um, I think lots of people have realised the extent to which it isn't a, a nice to have, um, that it really is a uh, key thing. Um, so, I just checking on time because I don't want to. Ah, discussion. We've had lots of discussion already. Um, but is, is there anything else that people would like to question, ask about, um, suggest, share from their experience? Um, I'm aware that we're, we're lucky to have quite a range of people here. Oh, Hannah, yes, please. Me again, sorry. Um, I just wondered about digital, whether you've looked into sort of digital audiences, obviously, as a result of the pandemic and what, what that's looking like if you have looked at it. Uh, we have um, the ah yes okay I'll come back to a question from Gabriella um, so yes I mean we we saw a st strong take up of digital but particularly amongst people 
or, or culturally engaged. Um, so it wasn't broadening the audience as much as it probably appeared from a venue point of view. If you see bigger numbers, um, it was often the same people attending more different things or attending at greater volumes. Um, I mean, not exclusively, and clearly there will be um, some extra engagement. Um, and we saw the proportion of people engaging in digital starting to tail off once we got into the autumn and people were substituting back. So there was, there was a clear kind of cross crossover. We're going out in person and therefore we're not um, doing as much online. Um, but digital had kind of flattened a bit during the pandemic anyway. There was, yeah, there was, you know, in the data you can see there was a big burst and then it sort of quietened down a bit and then tapered. Um, that said, there are a bunch of people, but particularly that same set of groups who are most likely to attend in person now. So kind of, you know, younger, more engaged, more urban um, families, et cetera, um, who are keen to keep digital as part of their mix of engagement. So it's definitely not people wanting just to switch back to how it was. Yeah, I'd like to uh, agree with you on that one, Oliver, because that's been our experience. Um, we had an explosion of online audiences because we basically put our practice online. So we were getting engagement, global engagement during that the COVID time. Uh, <clears throat> and then when we back, went back to face to face, um, it wasn't, I'm doing face to face now and no longer online. We've ended up with like a hybrid going on. And we've actually got a little cohort of Leeds Black Elders, really, that only want the online. They don't want to be leaving their homes they, on the uh, mm -hmm. buses and this. They want to come into their front room, which we do, and do their little sessions. So they are and now a permanent online group that we have now which wasn't pre you know we didn't have in in covid and then we have the hybrid where you can choose to be online at or in person for the older uh, sorry for the middle-aged community um the people that have not engaged online or become less engaged are our children and young people because they want to come back to do the face-to-face -face. but what's interesting they are engaging more now in our social media ah. mm which is an interesting, interesting one, uh, much more than they did pre-COVID. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's interesting, very, very interesting stuff, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's intriguing. And, and certainly, I think there's, there's definitely a continuing role for um, digital, particularly in terms of groups that don't want to come, come back out. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, just to answer Gabriella's, um, very practical question about um, is there a reason why cinemas aren't generally tracked? Um, uh, there, there are a variety of more or less pragmatic reasons. Um, one of which is that cinemas tend to use different ticketing systems. Um, so we'd have to do extra rounds of t IT build, um, but also have often have very high levels of walk-ups, which means that they, their data capture is relatively lower. So it's been less of a priority. Um, but we do have a bunch of film data in Audience Finder. It's just film that tends to be put on by organisations that do other things as well. Um, and it's not that we don't want to include film data. And we certainly do include film in the participation monitor. So in terms of engagement behaviour overall, we have got that. Um, but yes, not so much on the, on the ticketing for that reason. Um, or we did surveys, I guess cinemas may be a little bit more reluctant to do the same thing and have less of a continuous stream of audiences and therefore it's harder to survey because everyone leaves the cinema at once and so it's kind of harder to um but obviously e-surveys will be a way around that um so yes um unless anyone else has anything they want to add at this point um and i would very happily um, keep chatting to you all day but i suspect that you probably have other things you want to do um but um I just um, move on to just a couple of summary things. Um, but it would be interesting to hear um, any reflections on this. Um, and yes, and I'll, I'll sort of, it's by way of by way of summary. I'll also sort of flag, um, you know, kind of follow up things. Um, so we've said that um, Leeds and Bradford um, population tends to skew young, but very differently. Um, that the um, obviously West Yorkshire has large South Asian and Asian British population, but it's quite varied in terms of particular places, particular communities, even within particular local authorities. 
Um, audiences tends to be local, um, both in terms of the types of audiences there are and what we know their typical behavior is, but also just watching the behavior at an aggregate level, we're seeing it being quite local. Um, so the importance of local places and strategy is really key. It can't just be about you know, big events in, in the center, although obviously that's also a key thing as well. Um, there's this interesting thing about Leeds and Bradford being quite reciprocal, but you know, this pool, certainly in this data set, at least um, screen towards Bradford, um, and different places being a bit more varied, you know, Kirk Lees, people heading lots of different, different directions, um, so to speak, um, but Wakefield's staying quite local and the relationship between Wakefield and Leeds as part of that being thing that's driving that effect. Um, it's going to Leeds is more local than going elsewhere would be. Um, we'd seen sales growth, but a bit of a skew towards more activity rather than more income off a set amount of activity um, and possibly income running a little bit below inflation, which obviously now we're in a position where inflation's rampant and people's incomes are really constrained does potentially raise some some challenges um so just from an economic point of view that can be tricky and i guess if people can prioritize if you're already doing extra digital things and the overall program has been getting bigger is there a way of kind of really focusing um obviously that's incredibly hard but i, I mentioned it <laughs> um the um continuing growth in middle low engaged groups which have higher concentrations of families it could be quite interesting it also plays into post-covid trends so that's kind of maybe a thing to to look for um there's maybe an opportunity to um promote more things that appeal to a wider range of younger people um than historically there might have been given the, the balance of who's most likely to be engaged now so again that could be an opportunity um so yes that's just a few a few Broad headlines. Um, so I'd, I'd very welcome either either now or indeed um, by email later, uh, which I'll share my um, email in a sec. Um, very happy to hear further thoughts and follow on conversations. Uh, we'll share a link to our community, um, which is you know, a place again where we'll share the slides. But you can also have conversations about some of this. Um, flagging here in terms of some of the um, audience spectrum groups which ones do the subgroups to really focus on um ones that are particularly exposed in terms of cost of living might want to think about um and yeah that family motivation being a, a key driver um but i think that is it from me for now um but yes um i hope everyone has as, as catherine says a lovely lovely weekend lots of cultural engagement um, and obviously a great few years um, by the time by the time of how things are going to be going um there are some other events coming up if these are particular to your interests i'm aware we've not talked as much about visual arts this time as um we could have done and that was something which will be picked up in that session in august um but yes other than that to say um we'll share um, this content online um we'll um we'll take out the discussion bit but we'll share the um the slides um and other information and yeah just let us know if we can be helpful um so yeah thank you very much and and good luck <laughs>